this week we are going to add a way for the player to win or to lose. We are going to add a little bit of story so that the player has a thing to do, a mission or a purpose. And we are going to build some ways for the player to fall into some fire and have to restart or run out of time and have to restart. Uh, or just if they get stuck, we want them to be able to press R to restart or escape, maybe. And this will allow us to build all sorts of new and interactive experiences. So let's get started. Here in my indoor level, this is where the player starts. And what I'd like to do is build this, this starting area where the player has to go through a series of places. Maybe there's a door right here, and we can require the key, which is over here. So the player has to go back through here, sorry, through this doorway, and then come back through, and then it goes through this way, and maybe we'll build it to be windy some way, and the, the end point will be here at B. And maybe they've got only two minutes to do this, and the timer will tick down and down and maybe they'll see some cool displays all over the place that says self-destruct in two minutes. And so that's kind of the functionality that we want to, that I want to build today. So the first thing that I want to be able to do is I want to be able to reset the player um, back to where it is. We may or may not be able to reset the direction that they're looking, um, but we can at least move the player back to where they started. So let's build that functionality. Let's go to our player controller script. Uh, my favorite way to open those scripts is to double click on the gray uh, name of the script. And let's go ahead and build our first uh, input. And, and I think I know how to do this. I'm going to make sure. Give me one minute. Well, we'll see how it goes. Let's, let's see. Uh, th so this is the old way. I'm going to see if this is the, the right way. We're going to build void update, which is a function that existed when we first created this script. Uh, we deleted it because we didn't need it yet. Uh, An update runs once every frame. So for every script that has an update function in our scene, it will run this function one time uh, until it resets the, the screen again. So the old way looks like this. Don't, don't write this down yet. Get key down key code dot, let's do R, and uh, debug dot log resetting player. Okay, so I'm going to press R, and it's going to say you're trying to reuse input, but we don't do that anymore, which is good. So. Let's delete that for now. We still need update. And up here at the top where it says using Unity Engine, I want to add using Unity Engine dot input system. Uh, and that will allow us to use the new Unity input system that the first person controller is using. So the code that we want is var keyboard. And var is a generic kind of variable type that I don't like to use. Uh, but every once in a while, it's, it comes in handy. Uh, in this case, when we specify what keyboard is, when like for example, when we say keyboard.current, then keyboard or, or C++, C sharp, C sharp knows that var is of the type keyboard or whatever keyboard.current is. Uh, and then we're going to do a check to make sure that 
we have a keyboard, for example, if keyboard is equal to null return. So just uh, if no keyboard exists, do nothing. And so that, that return word right there, that keyword, uh, means that it won't do any other functionality after this. The update function is basically done right here. Um, we can maybe change do nothing to um, stop running update. Okay, and then finally, if keyboard dot r key dot was pressed this frame. Um, let's call the reset player function, which we haven't built yet. And it will get a little error that says, hey, the reset player function doesn't exist. So let's build that right now. The return type is void. Uh, and this, by the way, we've dealt with on trigger enter, we've dealt with update. Those two are specific to Unity Engine, but this one we're building is specific to us. It doesn't exist anywhere else. We could call it whatever we wanted. We could call it, and that would be just fine. <laughs> but we don't want to. Uh, we want to call it reset player. And then what we want to do is move the player to start, um, reset the timer resets the number of keys because we might have already gotten the key and it would be it would it would skip a step of the story to make it so that the player didn't have to go all the way back to get the key all right so let's start with uh, moving the player to start and 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 by start i mean where the player was when we first hit hit play so we need to save that. Uh, right now we don't know what where the player was when we started. So we are going to build another function um, right above void update. So right above this comment here, I'm just going to hit total keys. The, put my cursor at the end of total keys and hit enter twice and write void start. This is another Unity Engine specific function. Uh, and we can write a comment here that just says save the player's current location as the start location. So up above total keys, up above start, below total keys, above start. We want a vector three. Yeah. Vector three start position. And we'll make it equal. Well, we won't make it equal to anything. We'll just set it there. So down in start, we will say that start position is equal to this dot transform dot position. So if we go to the transform component in Unity, it has a position variable x, y, and z, that means it's a vector 3. And so in this case, it's going to be 0, 0, 0. That was easy. Um, but if we start and if we end up putting the player somewhere else, maybe we want the player to start here. Well, then the start position will be negative 21.22, 0, and 0. OK. So let's. I wonder if we can debug that just to make sure it's working correctly. Um, debug dot log starting position is starting position. Let's see what that says. So we'll go back to Unity. We will hit play and look down in the console for starting position is 0, 0, 0. And if we move the player somewhere else, starting position is negative 23, 0, 0. Excellent. 
Um, I was supposed to put a... F supposed to put down a button. If I press R, it was supposed to move us. But we haven't, we haven't implemented the moving of the player yet. So let's do that now. Now that we have this start position, whenever reset player is called, we are going to say... Uh, this dot transform dot position is equal to start position. Maybe it'll be that easy. Expect there's one or two things missing, but who knows? Okay, so let's move out of that regular position and press R. Okay. So, nothing happened. Uh, whenever nothing happens, you want to add debug.logs to make sure that your code is talking to you. This is the easiest way to get through what's happening. So, I'm going to build a debug.log at the start of reset player that just says starting the reset player function or method. And if I see this, then I know that we at least got to this line and this line should be next and maybe there's something wrong there. But if I don't see this, well, now I can start looking here. I can start seeing if I named update correctly, other things like that. Because I'm not certain that pressing R is, is built the right way. I think that it is, but I don't know for sure. Oh, nope. So it is working correctly all the way to this debug.log. So I know that pressing R works and calls the reset player method. In the past, the way to fix this was to go to the player capsule and then change the rigid body to interpolate and continuous. I'm not sure it works like that anymore. does not appear to. Hold on for one moment. All right, so I did a little bit of digging and I found a couple of ideas that we'll try out. Um, the easier of the two ideas is to go to edit and project settings and physics and under auto sync transforms. And the idea is that the physics engine says you can't just magically move from one place to another place. Um, but that's what we're trying to do. So if we auto sync transforms, maybe the rigid body will sync with the transform component and just work. So I'm going to turn that on and I am going to hide the project settings behind the scene view, hit play and see if it works. So we move around a little bit and we press R. That seemed promising. We move around a little bit and we Press R. Okay, I like that. The other X solution was worse. It was, uh, you could go to the player capsule and you could turn off the player controller, the character controller, and then move, and then turn the character controller back on. This is a little janky, would have involved some code, but one checkbox is pretty easy, so I'll show you again where that is. Under edit project settings, and then physics, and auto sync transforms. Turn that on. And that will sync the transform and the rigid body components whenever possible. Cool. Okay, so we have resetting the player. We don't have resetting the rotation. And I think I'm gonna leave that alone. Uh, because, again, that involves manually rotating. Uh, I don't know. I guess we could try it. We, we can always try it. Uh, so as I move around in the scene, we should be able to watch the rotation of our player also move around on the y-axis pretty much only. Um, but I want to try that out too. I don't think it'll work. But this auto sync trans transforms seems to work great. So we'll just try it. Let's try a quaternion. 
uh, start rotation. And we will say start rotation is equal to this.transform.rotation. So rotations can't just be X, Y's, and Z's. Uh, you, can, you can set it up that way, uh, but they have to know multiple rotations because as you rotate and then rotate now, when you rotate, you're rotating, rotating a different way. Something to do with gimbal lock. Anyway, quaternions are different. So we save the start rotation and in reset player, we are also going to say that this dot transform dot rotation is equal to start rotation. Fingers crossed. So the idea is that when I hit R, I will be looking down the hall. Move over here and press R. And it did, it rotated. One of the things I don't like is that I'm seeing it start to snap. And I don't, I don't like that. And if that's something that, I don't know what that's down to, but I really don't like it. So R resets the look rotation. That's neat. Uh, but I'm going to comment that out for a second, because if that's what I have to live with in order to get the rotation to work, it's not worth it. I need smooth look rotation. Hmm. Now nah, it's still a little bit spazzy. But now I'm not certain what, what that was. You know, does it go all the way back to this... Uh, physics and then auto sync transforms. If I turn that off, will it still be okay? So it's still janky. So it's not related to the auto sync transforms, and that means that I can turn this start rotation back on, which is what I want you to do too. And hopefully we won't have the jank forever. If so, we'll fix that down the road. Okay. Let's talk about the next thing. And let's move our player back to the right spot. And R. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. OK, so let's download TextMesh Pro and tell a short story. So under window and then uh, package manager, I like to dock this behind the scene view as well. Uh, then we can go over to the right side of the window and search for text mesh. Okay. No results. Packages. Oh, you know what? This is actually a... Uh, unity registry package so there are the assets that you got from the asset store and then there are the assets that come with unity but just aren't installed uh, and right here is text mesh pro if you're interested in looking at some of the other ones pro builder post processing poly brush pro grids those are all really good too uh, so i'm going to get where did it go text mesh pro And it's already imported. That was easy. <laughs> but if, if yours is not imported, then go ahead and uh, add it. So all we need to do is go to Game Object, 3D Object, Text, Text Mesh Pro. And there are two kinds. Uh, so there are the 3D objects, which exist in the world just like a cube. And then there are the... UI objects which stick to the camera and don't move at all. Um, and I'm going to leave I'm going to leave the examples and extras out. If you want to look at them, there are a few more fonts you can use, um, but we'll probably build our own fonts pretty quickly. So sample text by default starts out rather large. Uh, a word of warning: don't mess with these. 
Um, they really mess with your text in a weird way, and it's hard to get them back perfect. I like to use the rect tool, which is the uh, R, no, it's T. And then you can use these corners and uh, things work a little bit more consistently there. Okay, so let's build a story. I'm just going to build it on the door so that as soon as the player goes through the door, it stops existing. I think. I think that's how it should work. Uh, especially if I make this story a child of the door. So where is my door at? There's my door. So door. And then I'm going to name this Text Mesh Pro Story. And make it a child of the door. And over here on the right side, where it says Text Mesh Pro Texts, um, we can see the sample text and change it to something like, you need a key. Uh, and then if you look over on the right side there, some of the other options are the font size, whether or not it's bold or italic or underlined. You can tell them to be all caps or all lowercase. Um, you can even make it so that they are, so this is small caps. It's all in caps, but the capitalization is a larger uh, object. So you can edit your font size here. Uh, one of the things that I recommend doing uh, in all of your text is adding an outline. So a little bit further down in the material settings here. Let's see if I can get both in frame. There we go. Um, I like to add an outline. And as we increase its thickness, it just adds a black border to your text. Uh, the other one I like to mess with is dilate. Uh, if you make that larger, it gets kind of poofy. Uh, or you can make it very thin and, uh, and needle shape-esque. Um, but yeah, I like to build, I like to build my text with uh, some dilation and some outline. And then we can do things like align center and align vertically center. Uh, and that way, at least the uh, text is in the middle of your gizmo instead of being offset. Um, and then if you need to write a longer story, let's say that we uh, duplicate this. And we say um, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Uh, we can edit this to, you know, be aligned to one side or the other side or straight across like this. Things to know about, things to play with. Uh, you can change the color of your text here. Uh, maybe you want to go for black with a white outline. You can change the outline color like that. Um, but generally, you want your outline to be the opposite color of your text so that if it's on a dark background, so black on a black background is kind of hard to read right there. Um, but if we have the outline, that's, that's easy to read. Uh, and vice versa if it's a white text on a white background. Okay. So let's have our story there. Here's our story. Let's move this to this wall here. Move it out just a little bit. And I'm going to have it say something like... Um, Escape, find the key, and get to the exit before um, power plants overload. And this has that uh, all caps thing. I'm going to turn that off. And this is a little bit too dilated to be easy to read, so I'm going to turn that dilation down. And I like that. That, uh, that looks good. Definitely need some exclamation points. There we go. 
maybe the outline's a little bit too strong. I probably just wish that it was white text instead of black text, but oh well. Um, we can always do fun things like adding a text mesh pro onto all of our keys. So if I duplicated this text here and just moved it out, um, we could just say that this is a key. And this text would be a child of that sphere. No, sorry, different sphere. Uh, we would just set its position to 000, zero, zero uh, and then just move its position up slightly so you could see, you know, it's got this uh, text around the key that just says a uh, key. And that's, I don't know, that's fun. So let's, let's see what that looks like. So you need a key, a key, and there you go. And both the text and the door and the key go away. Where did my story go, though? This one right here. Oh, it went somewhere really strange. All right. So let's move you back down to there. Love it. Uh, one of the things I really like to do with TextMesh Pro is throw my credits on the screen. Um, so once I get to the end, I'll say something like a level built by Brian Foster for Game Design 1 at Butler Community College. It's a good idea. You should do it too. Okay, so we have some story. And we have a way to reset the player. What's next is to build some hazards. So essentially, I'm just going to build a thing I'm going to build. Let's let's build a cube. Um, let's just call this a uh, death cube. And we are going to shrink it down and scale it up. And if the player runs into this death cube, we are going to respawn the player. Let's find a good material for this. So we've got walls. I'm going to duplicate that and call this one um, lava. Just as a generic term, you know. It's, okay, pretty red. There we go. The, the torch color would be pretty good. Um, but let's put the lava on there. I'm going to make it emissive and, and make it a little bit bright. Let's go a little bit redder. Yeah, something like that. So, and then with this death cube selected, if I go over to the tags, there might be one that says respawn. So this isn't the, the respawn point, but this is a thing to say, if you run into something tagged as respawn, then respawn. I think that's fine. Let's do that. So back to our code. We did this last week or in the last module, how often you're doing this. Um, in on trigger enter, if other game object compare tag key, if it's door, and then underneath that we'll have another which is if other dot game object dot compare tag respawn, and then we'll just call the reset player function. That's all we have to do. I'm realizing that without a significant amount of more programming, it will be hard to add the key and add the door back to this level. So we might leave out the idea that we should reset the number of keys. Um, we can just make it easier for the player. So let's, let's leave out resetting the number of keys for now. Because otherwise we would have to go in and rebuild a key and keep track of everything the way it was and reset it back to the way it was. And that could be a bit of an issue. The, another thing that we can do absolutely is just reload the level. Um, let's, let's code that really quickly. Um, so let's go to, let's just go to update 
So this is just going to be reload the scene as is. And we're going to say if keyboard dot escape key dot was pressed this frame. I actually don't know what the escape key is. So let's let's track that down. Um, one moment. OK. So this is the input system 1.0.2. I'm on the Unity documentation. And I am looking for what are the names of all the inputs. Here's keyboard.current. And if I was looking in here for escape, is it that easy? No. Um, there is this example with A key or Alt key. So I was hopeful that, you know, escape key. A lot of these are of the type key control. So I'm hopeful that key control might show us all of the different keys. But that's not the case. So hold on a minute. All right, I found it. Uh, it is escape key with a lowercase e. So easy to fix. So if they press the escape key, we can call application dot load level. And then we'll just load level zero for now. Uh, this is going to require an, an additional step, which is that we put this zero uh, in the build settings. We put this level in the build settings. So if we go to file and build settings, the sample scene is currently build index of zero. We want to add open scenes. And we want to remove the sample scene by removing selection. So let's try that out. We are going to hit play. Let's go ahead and uh, get that key, open that door, and hit escape. And there's our key again. There's our door again. And if we hit R, we're back here. But the door is already open because the key's already gone. And if we hit escape again, we do this. So I might build this into once you get the level finished, you do this. Um, we also might build escape as a quit the game. So we might build a different key for that later. Um, but for now, that's, that's what we want. Okay. So next, we should build some obstacles. Oh, we were going to talk about uh, having this reset the player. Uh, let's go ahead and try that out. Let's see if we got that working. And boom, reset the player. There's all sorts of puzzles you can build. Um, if the player gets it just wrong, you know they, they reset to the last known location. Uh, one of the things that we'll build more in Game Design 2 is this system of checkpoints where we're moving the player back and we're resetting their health and their mana and other things like that. Um, for now, this will suffice. Um, here is some lava that the player has to navigate. And I will just duplicate this around my level a few times. Uh, maybe just one in the middle here. So the player will have to be careful to avoid these vats of of lava, I guess. So I'll build one here that's maybe longer. 
And then I'll shift it around so that the player has to go through here. Um, switch these around because I actually want the player to come out on this side last. And I'll eventually build some kind of ending here. Uh, so one of the downsides, well, one of the things that I don't like so much is that every time I bring in a text mesh pro, it brings in a huge one. And it always brings it in in the same place over here. And so once I've made the changes that I like to the text that I have, what I want to do is just start duplicating it and moving it into position around my level. So I can just hold down control and shift and just drag it over here onto the wall. Rotate it 90 degrees by holding control and then put it on the wall with control and shift and then move it out slightly to, to edit it. So now I'll say this is um, exit. Uh, and we can make the size much larger. Set it to be centered. Yeah, and if you want to pixel perfect, put it in the right spot. Hit F to focus on the object that you want. Select your other object and go to Game Object, Move to View. And that will move it directly in the center, at which point we can just pull it out just slightly. And I'll probably move mine down a little bit. There it is, uh, properly centered over my doorway. Okay, so let's build a timer. And then we'll be done, I think. So in the top of our player controller, we are going to build a serialized field. And let's make this a float that says, uh, time timer interval and let's make it equal to i don't know 120 seconds um, we can even add a range so if we say range from let's say 30 seconds to maybe 300 seconds Yeah, that's, that's probably good. Uh, we also need to build a float named timer. Uh, and we'll make it equal to zero. Okay. So in start, we are going to say that timer is equal to timer interval. So reset the timer. And in update, at the top, we are going to essentially just subtract time from our timer. And if our timer gets to zero, we're going to call the reset player function. So every frame subtracts time from timer. So timer minus equals time dot delta time. Uh, and if you look up time dot delta time, uh, let's see if we can hover over it. The interval in seconds from the last frame to the current one. So it's a really small, it's like 0 0.01 uh, seconds. And then we're just going to have an if statement that says if timer is less than zero, call reset player and reset player is also going to reset the timer okay you ready um, down here under reset player we need to reset the timer so timer is equal to uh, timer interval 
And that should be the last bit of code to do that. So if we look at our first person controller, we can see the timer interval and it's on a slider since we made it a range all the way up to 300 all the way down to 30. I'm going to set it to 30 uh, because I want to know when it's going to reset. I want to be able to test that it resets. So if I hit play, I know that roughly 30 seconds from now, I will get automatically reset. So I'm just going to run around try to avoid resetting myself accidentally. I forgot that I was going to build the key into here. So run around, get the key, avoid the fire. Up the stairs, open this doorway, avoid some more fire and now I'm reset. That was 30 seconds. So we know that our reset code works, but it, it's not very much fun if the player doesn't know how much time they have left. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to build a, a text mesh pro script or a text mesh pro object that can be changed um, based on whatever the timer's value is. So I'm going to build a little, I guess I'm just going to build a text mesh pro. Um, and then we'll call this timer text. And we'll scale it down. Actually, I hate scaling it down. I just want to scale the font size down. Okay, and I'll move it here. And we'll say that uh, 30.00 you think something like that it really needs to be something like 30.00 that'll be as that as much time accuracy as we need so this <laughs> timer text uh, needs to be edited the specifically the text field needs to be edited by our script. So in our script at the top, we have using Unity Engine, using Input System, and using TM Pro. And then we will build a text. Uh, let's make it public. So, well, not public, but serialized field. Text mesh pro uh, timer text. And in update, we will have our timer text dot. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Timer text dot text is equal to timer dot to string. And in quotes, we're going to add 0, 0.00. I think that'll give us what we want. Um, this little bit is formatting. It formats the, the string um, to not be a whole bunch of numbers, to, but just to be two digits of accuracy. So our player should have a variable, an empty variable, um, none text mesh pro, and we want to drag our timer text into that spot. Let's hit play and see what happens. Okay. And we can put a little bit of text that says, you know, time left at the top. What happens if we set the timer interval to 130 seconds? Okay, it's just 137 seconds. Um, so maybe I'll build a another 
another timer text that just says timer label. It'll come up here and it'll say seconds until overload. I can see now why I wanted to scale it lower. Let's bring the font size down quite a bit more. Let's put this on two lines. We can even change the line spacing to be a little bit smaller if we wanted. And uh, one thing that I thought would be fun is to build a little 3D object cube, um, a little box for this to sit on. So let's get both of these texts, move them forward, and then make this box fit that spot a little bit better. Because um, what, what I would like to do is I would like to have multiple of these boxes around the level. So I'll just rename this cube timer. And you can see that I've made the both of the pieces of text children. Okay, so good thing we can do is we've got the timer and it works. Bad thing is that the timer only exists in one spot. Also, I should keep in mind, one of the things we can do if we play our cards right is we can set the size of this box so that the text fits in here best. So if we go down to auto size for our text, okay, it's gonna overflow, but we don't want it to overflow. Let's say that the minimum is, yeah, something like five, and the max is something like nine. Uh, and then what happens is when we get to 130, or a thousand, it gets smaller as it needs to. And so I just want to make sure that it's able to go from 130 or 330 um, down to zero uh, without without messing up too much. So that auto size function is really nice. And then it's just got min and max, uh, which you should set. Okay. So. Instead of just one text, we're going to build several. And in our code, we are going to have to alter this uh, timer text issue a little bit. What we want to build is a list, a list of text objects, and then for each object in the list, update the time. It'll be pretty straightforward. So at the beginning of our Text Mesh Pro timer text, we're going to add lists. And then we're going to say that, oh, right, up at the very top, right before using Unity Engine, we need using system.collections.generic. And that is required for lists to work correctly. And then we'll say it's equal to a new list of texts Mesh Pro. Just like that. So down in update, we're gonna we're gonna keep this line, but we're gonna say for each, okay, uh, text mesh pro um, text in timer texts like that. And we are going to say text.text .text equals timer.toString. And this will work even for one. And the idea is just that for each text mesh pro object named text in timer text, that's our list of texts, um, the text's text field uh, is equal to the timer's value. 
That's it. Let's go look at the changes that we have to make in Unity. Our first person player capsule now has a size, which we can change to uh, one, two, three, four. I'm going to say four. And then if we drop this little arrow down, we can see now there are four spaces for the text that we want. Yes. Okay, so here's our timer. And I am going to take that first timer text and place it in that first timer text spot. And then I'm going to duplicate this whole timer box and move it into the other room. Maybe I'll put it back on that wall. And I can go back to my player capsule and I can drag this second timer text there. So it should update this one as well. And then I will duplicate this and bring it over here. And maybe I'll put one on either wall. Control and shift to snap. I'm also gonna make this one bigger because why not? Back to the player capsule. There's the third timer text. Uh, and then we'll build the fourth one maybe right here. Um, I forgot to duplicate it. Duplicate and shift drag, rotate. Okay, a little bit smaller to fit in there. Player capsule. Drag the fourth timer text. Now, let's hit play and see if it goes in all the places. All right, 136. Let's get a key. Let's walk through the door. And there they are. The, others, uh, the other signs are working great, too. There's the other sign. And there will be a key in here eventually. I'll walk up and make sure the fourth sign is working fine and we'll be pretty close to done. Okay, so once we get to the end, we should probably pause the timer so that it doesn't, you know, we get to the end and then it resets us back to the beginning anyway. Um, we should probably pause the timer when we get to the end and we should have some text that says, congratulations, you did it. Uh, let's, let's do that. So I'm gonna duplicate this text, uh, rotate it, why won't you rotate correctly? Oh, because you are still attached to something else. There we go. Uh, say something like, uh, you have escaped. Put it on two lines. Bring the text size up quite a bit. I'll build the room out for that later. I'll let you all build your own rooms out. Um, but there's the you have escaped. And let's build a trigger for the player to run into that will stop the timer. So game object, 3D object, sphere. Let's go ahead and build this up quite a bit in size. Make sure it's fully through the door. And when the player hits this uh, invisibly, uh, we're going to make it a trigger so that they don't hit it and stop. Uh, and we're going to make it invisible by turning off the mesh renderer. So all we should be able to see is the sphere collider. There it is. So let's go ahead and tag this as a tag that already exists, the finish tag. And we'll build a Boolean in our, in our script to stop the timer if we hit this tag. So first off, a Boolean that says timer is running. Bool timer is running equal to true. Uh, and a Boolean is, is only capable of two values, true or false. It can't be maybe, it can't be 0.5, it can't be the color red, it can't be the string banana. 
it's just true or false. That's all it can be. And that's really nice because you can test whether it's true or false very quickly. Uh, so in our update, we've got this timer e minus equals time dot delta time, but we're actually going to say if timer is running, then subtract time from timer. Uh, and if this is false, so, so by default, this little test here um, is the same thing as saying is equal to true. Um, but since timer is running is already true or false, and that's what the if statement is checking for, you don't have to have this equals equals true. Anyway, uh, I'll leave it in there because it's easy to read. But once you're tired of typing out equals equals true, just get rid of it. And then finally down in on trigger enter. Reset player on trigger enter. If we run into a key or a door or a respawn, if other dot game object dot compare tag uh, finish. All we're going to do is we're going to say timer is running equal to false. Now stop the timer. So I'll check that out one more time, but I will move the player closer so that I don't have to walk real slowly through my entire level. Uh, yeah, you probably shouldn't be in the middle of the... There we go. Okay. Hit play. Verify that the timer is moving. And then walk to the exits and turn around to verify there you go that the timer stopped okay and then you've got a video game uh, you have a goal that the player has to achieve you can start adding a bunch of particles and falling animated boxes and a lot of scary alarm noises and lights that spin around just a whole bunch of different ways to make it feel like your level is about to explode or the train is about to leave. Um, all sorts of different things you could do with a timer. Um, you know, maybe the respawn values, in, you know, if the train is leaving, uh, maybe you don't have a ticket. And so you're trying to jump over the ticket lines and all of your respawners are just uh, little policemen trying to come waddle towards you and, and grab you. And if they grab you, then you have to start over. Anyway, thanks for hanging out. See you in the next one.